Space Octopodes. Today we're going to be discussing an article that uh, went all over the internet various ways. Uh, closest to the original source that I can get other than the paper itself is um, a, an article by, uh, that's in Express.com UK. And it's entitled Science News, Octopuses Came to Earth from Space as Frozen Eggs Millions of Years Ago. By Claren McGrath, published in uh, uh, May 14, and uh, uh, updated shortly thereafter. Um, for the P-dance among you, octopuses, octopi, and octopodes are all correct. At least that's what my best sources tell me. Uh, octopuses is the way you would conjugate it in English. Octopi is the way you would conjugate it in Latin. But it is actually Greek, so I left it with octopodes. Um, the article begins, octopuses are aliens which evolved on another planet before arriving on Earth hundreds of millions ago as cryopreserved eggs via a process known as panspermia. Radical new research has suggested. Uh, the extraordinary claims were made in a report entitled Cause of Cambrian Explosion, Terrestrial or Cosmic. Wait a minute. Cambrian Explosion octopi are quite a bit later than that. So, it's interesting how things get messaged. Which was co-authored by a group of 33 scientists and published in the Progress of Biophysics and Molecular Biology journal. The paper suggests that the ex explanation for the sudden flourishing of life during the Cambrian era, often referred to as the Cambrian explosion, lies in the stars as a result of the Earth being bombarded by clouds of organic molecules. Um, actually, more than clouds of organic molecules, clouds of um, DNA, RNA, and such things as that, that are actually have information in them. But the scientists go on to make an even more extraordinary claim concerning octopuses, which seem to have evolved on Earth quite rapidly, something like 270 million years ago, 250 million years after the Cambrian explosion. The paper states, the genome of the octopus shows a staggering level of complexity with 33 thousand protein coding genes, more than is present in Homo sapiens. Now, I'm going to tell you there should be a comma there. There is not. There is not in the original article either. We'll read it again. Um, the, the source they cite says there are 33,000 genes. So um, it's not 33,000 more than humans have, which would be some 55,000 or something like that, depending on who's counting. Um, it's large brain and sophisticated nervous system, camera-like eyes, flexible bodies, instantaneous camouflage via the ability to switch color and shape are just a few, just a few of the striking features that appear suddenly on the evolutionary scene. The idea is this, uh, this thing just suddenly pops on the scene full-formed um, the transformative genes leading from consensus ancestral nautilus to the common cuttlefish to squid to the common, I'm sure that should read octopus. Um, in fact, we'll read it again, so we'll see if it's there the second time. Are not easily to, to be found in any of the pre-existing life, in any pre-existing life form. Novel stuff coming out. It is plausible then to suggest they seem to be borrowed from a far distant future in terms of terrestrial evolution, or more real realistically, from the cosmos at large, which presumably is in advance of us in terms of evolution. 
One plausible explanation in our view is that the newly is that the new genes are likely to be new extraterrestrial imports to Earth. Most plausibly is an already coherent group of functioning genes within, say, cryopreserved and matrix protected fertilized octopus eggs. Thus the possibility that cryopreserved squid and, and or octopus eggs arrived in icy bolide several hundred million years ago should not be discounted as that would be a parsimonious cosmic explanation for the octopus's sudden emergence on Earth circa 270 million years ago. That's what they're doing. They are just flat out giving up on the standard Darwinian evolution. It doesn't work. The suggestion is all the more interesting because octopuses have frequently been touted as a possible model for extraterrestrial beings. In his 1898 sci-fi classic Martians, In War of the Worlds, H.G. Wells conceived his Martians as octopus-like creatures with massive brains. Some of you may have read that and realized it. Meanwhile, the 2016 film Arrival concerns first contact with an alien cephalopod race. And I'm adding my own. And of course, we cannot leave out the Therians from Galaxy Quest, which look like that. Um, in his book, Other Minds, The Octopus, The Sea, and the Deep Origins of Consciousness, author Peter Godfrey Smith wrote, if we cannot make contact, pardon me, if we can make contact with cephalopods as sentient beings, it is not because of a shared history, not because of kinship, but because evolution built minds twice over. This is probably the closest we will come to meeting an intelligent alien. And that's the end of the blurb that announces this article. Now, the article itself is actually available online. Um, Cause of Cambrian Explosion Terrestrial or Cosmic, Progress in Biophysics and Molecular Biology. Steele E.J. et al., there's about 30 et al.s, and um, there's uh, one of them is uh, Chandra uh, uh, I'm lacking on his exact name, Wikma Chandra, I believe it is. Um, Chandra, it's, it's the, the sidekick of Fred Hoyle. Chandra Wikma Singh? Wikma Singh, probably. Um, anyway, um, and two of his relatives, I don't know whether his kids or what, um, are also on the list. Wick, uh, Wick Rama Singh, that, that's what it is. And the abstract reads, we review the salient evidence consistent with or predicted by the Hoyle Wick Rama Singh thesis of cometary or cosmic biology. Much of this physical and biological evidence is multifactorial. One particular focus are the recent studies which date the emergence of the complex retroviruses of vertebrate lines at or near just or at or just before the Cambrian explosion of about 500 million years ago. Such viruses are known to be plausibly associated with major evolutionary genomic processes. We believe this coincidence is not fortuitous, but is consistent with a key prediction of HW theory, whereby major extinction diversification evolutionary boundaries coincide with virus-bearing cometary bolide bombardment events. So the explanation for the Cambrian explosion may be uh, transformative viruses. Um, it's certainly better than the, the standard one in terms of constructing uh, new uh, genetic pathways and so forth. A second focus is the remarkable evolution of intelligent complexity, cephalopods, culminating in the emergence of the octopus. So it's not unfair to pick out the octopus as being the most interesting part of this. Um, a third focus concerns the microorganism fossil evidence contained within meteorites 
as well as the detection in the upper atmosphere of apparent incoming life-bearing particles from space. In our view, the totality of the multifactorial data and critical analyses assembled by Fred Hoyle, Chandra Wickramasinghe, and their many colleagues since the 1960s lead to a very plausible conclusion. Life may have been seeded here on Earth by life-bearing comets as soon as conditions on Earth allowed it to flourish, about or just before 4.1 billion years ago. And in fact, some of the evidence that we have may be cooked stuff from a space that didn't make it because it got cooked on the way down or cooked once it got here. Um, and living organisms such as space resistant and space hardy bacteria, viruses, more complex eukaryotic cells, fertilized ova and seeds have been continuously delivered ever since to Earth, so being one important driver of further terrestrial evolution, which has resulted in considerable genetic diversity and which has led to the emergence of mankind. That's what they're going to be talking about. Now they have three quotes at the beginning which are probably worth repeating. Uh, one, the historian of science may be tempted to claim that when paradigms change, the world itself changes with them. That's this structure of scientific revolutions by so Thomas S. Kuhn. Um, and in fact, um, Kuhn tended to be almost a, uh, uh, he sort of played the line on uh, on kind of a postmodern view of science. When presented with the uncanny survival attributes of tardigraves, a friend exclaimed, how on earth did they evolve? And the reason why is because tardigraves are really almost made for outer space. How do you evolve them on earth? How do you evolve those kinds of tough uh, properties? Maybe they didn't evolve, but. And then finally, the idea that in the whole universe life is unique to the earth is essentially pre-Copernican. Experience has now repeatedly taught us that this type of thinking is very likely wrong. Why should our own infinitesimal niche in the universe be unique? Just as no one country has been in the center of the earth, so the earth is not the center of the universe. And that's a quote from Life Cloud by Hoyle and Wickramasinghe. Purpose of the article. It's always nice to have an article that sets out exactly where it's going. This review article is intended to represent, in the main, the collective knowledge and wisdom of over 30 scientists and scholars across many disciplines of the physical and biological sciences. We review much of the key experimental and observational data gathered over the past 60 years consistent with or predicted by the Hoyle Wickrama Singh thesis of commentary or cosmic biology. We are acutely aware that mainstream thinking on the origin and further evolution of life on Earth is anchored firmly in the terrestrial paradigm. Our aim is here is to facilitate further discussion in the biophysical, biomedical, and evolutionary science communities to the quite different HW cosmic origins viewpoint, which better handles, in our opinion, a wider range of physical, astrophysical, biological, and biophysical facts often quite inexplicable, if not contradictory, under the dominant terrestrial neo-Darwinian paradigm. Further, if some readers are hoping to read a disquisition based on population genetics type analyses, as one reviewer has put it, analyses of evolutionary rates, examples of appearances of new genes with no homology to old ones, etc., they will mostly be disappointed. Apparently, there is an argument to be made on that score. Although some genetic features from recent data in the octopus and other cephalopods provide challenging examples to conventional evolutionary thinking, but that is not the main thrust of this review. The general and admittedly unusual scientific writing style is to ensure clear, plain English communications across many scientific disciplines. However, of iconic specific interest, we discuss the recent phylogenetic data which date the emergence of the complex retroviruses of vertebrate lines at or just before the Cambrian explosion of 500 million years ago, the widely agreed epical event in the evolutionary history of multicellular life on Earth. 
These types of reverse transcribing and genome integrating viruses are speculated to be plausibly associated with major evolutionary genomic processes. We believe this coincidence with the Cambrian explosion may not be fortuitous, but consistent with a key prediction of HW theory, whereby major extinction diversification evolutionary boundaries coincide with cometary bolide bombardment events, delivering hypothesized viruses, microorganisms, and more complex eukaryotic systems to Earth during the past 4.5 billion years of Earth's history. Um, skipping over little pieces here and there, the plausible scientific uh, conclusion is reached that life was seeded here on Earth by life-bearing comets as soon as conditions on Earth allowed it to flourish, at or just before 4.1 billion years ago. And living organisms such as space-resistant and space-hardy bacteria, viruses, more complex eukaryotic cells and organisms, for example, tardigrades. We talked about those tardigrades before. Perhaps even fertilized ova and plant seeds may have been continuously delivered ever since to Earth, helping to drive further the progress of terrestrial biological evolution. This process, since the time of Lord Kelvin and Svante Arrhenius, has a scientific name, panspermia. Um, he, they talk about habitable exoplanets, and they talk about a paradigm shift, and then they go into their introductory remarks. The Aristotelian paradigm of the spontaneous generation of life, that the idea that the simplest life forms emerge spontaneously on Earth, fireflies from a mixture of warm Earth and morning dew, has survived in one form or another for over 2,000 years. It has withstood the contradictory evidence on several occasions during this time. They talk now about Pasteur's 1862 experiments. Some of you may remember some of that. And then they talk about John Tyndall, who adopted this view that life only comes from life. And on the 21st of January of 1870, lectured at the Royal Institution in London on the implication for panspermia. It is interesting and noteworthy that the newly established magazine Nature objected to this lecture in its editorial columns with some passion. You can't do that. Behind the objection was the realization that were Pasteur's dictum to be strictly true, life only comes from life, then the origin of life would need to be external to Earth. In other words, if Pasteur is right, the evolutionary program is dead. The continuing antagonism to the panspermic implications of Pasteur's dictum led the way to the emergence of the dominant biological paradigm, a biogenesis in a primordial soup. This is the article criticizing, um, not for the last time, by the way, um, uh, a biogenesis. The latter idea was developed at a time when the earliest living cells were considered to be exceedingly simple structures that could subsequently evolve in a Darwinian way. These ideas should, of course, have been critically examined and rejected after the discovery of the exceedingly complex molecular structures involved in proteins and in DNA. But this did not happen. Modern ideas of abiogenesis and hydrothermal vents or elsewhere on the primitive Earth have developed into sophisticated conjectures with little or no evidential support. Ouch. Skipping a paragraph there. The recent report indicating in evidence of microbial life in Canadian rocks formed 4.1 to 4.23 billion years ago, with the reference, if accepted, makes it more difficult in our view to envision the option of abiogenesis taking place anywhere on the Earth. The claim that these rocks may have been associated with hydrothermal vents still raises the question of how life could have originated in situ on Earth in place during the early Hadean epoch, uh, named after Hades for what it's worth, <laughs> <laughs> that was riddled with frequent and violent collisions by asteroids and comets, and I might add was hot. Rather, we think it more reasonable to suggest that the particular evidence of microbial life in the Canadian rocks 
was delivered by cometary bolides only to be instantly destroyed or carbonized on impact. Skipping a few paragraphs. This then is a trigger warning. They're being, uh, well, they're attempting to be politically correct, I guess. Accurate scientific terminology can be unsettling because of their history, yet sometimes unavoidable. The terms panspermia and Lamarckian inheritance, despite their emotive implications and prejudicial overtones, will be used where deemed appropriate in this paper. And if you don't like it, go find your safe space, I guess. Skipping on several more paragraphs, um, down to the origin of life. A facile criticism is often leveled against the cosmic life theory is that it does not solve the problem of life's origin, but merely transfers it elsewhere. Whilst this may be true in the strictest sense, the importance of knowing whether or not life originated or could have done so de novo in the most minuscule of cosmic environments here on Earth, as against the cosmos as a whole, is a scientific question of paramount importance and one that needs to be addressed. Oh, well, that's not very much of a defense, is it? On the other hand, it does point out that the people who are leveling the charge are fighting against the evidence. It doesn't look like life originated on Earth. It doesn't look like it originated anywhere in the universe without some kind of intelligent input. And of course, you can go back so far and you run out of time. Skipping on, evolution of intelligent complexity. Uh, evidence of the roles of extraterrestrial viruses in affecting terrestrial evolution has recently been plausibly implied in the gene and transcriptome sequencing of cephalopods. Although they're going to suggest maybe it wasn't just viruses. The genome of the octopus shows a staggering level of complexity with 33,000 protein coding genes, and again there should be a comma there, more than is present in Homo sapiens. Octopus belong to the coleoid subclass of mollusks, cephalopods, that have an evolutionary history that stretches back over 500 million years. Although cephalopods' phylogenetics is highly inconsistent and confusing. And see the references. Cephalopods are also very diverse with the behaviorally complex coleoids, squid, cuttlefish, and octopus, presumably arising under a pure terrestrial evolutionary model from the more primitive nautiloids. However, the genetic divergence of octopus from its ancestral coleoid subclass is very great, akin to the extreme features seen across many genera and species noted in Eldridge Gould punctuated equilibrium patterns below. And we'll get to the Eldridge and Gould one more time. And it's interesting, you see, they're, they're pointing out that, that really octopi are not special in this regard. Or maybe they're more special than average, but, but there are plenty of other examples if you took them out. Its large brain and sophisticated nervous system, camera-like eyes, flexible bodies, instantaneous camouflage via the ability to switch color and shape are just a few of the striking fe features that suddenly appear on the evolutionary scene. The transformative genes leading from the consensus ancestral nautilus, for example, nautilus pompilius, to the common cuttlefish, to squid, local vulgaris, to the common octopus. Oh, they did have the octopus there. Remember, it was omitted in the uh, for a previous quote. That was a mutation. I rather suspect that that was a deleterious mutation. Um, <clears throat> are not easily to be found in any pre-existing life form. It is plausible then to suggest they seem to be borrowed from a far distant future in terms of terrestrial evolution or more realistically from the cosmos at large. Such an extraterrestrial origin as an explanation of emergence, of course, d runs counter to the prevailing dominant paradigm. And uh, there is figure five, squid plus virus equals octopus. Um, However, consistent with this conclusion, however, I think that should be a co comma, consistent with this conclusion, 
are the recent RNA editing transcriptome-wide data on the somatic RNA diversification mechanisms in the behaviorally sophisticated cephalopods such as octopus. These data demonstrate extensive evolutionary conserved adenosine to inosine mRNA editing sites in almost every single protein coding gene in the behaviorally complex colloid cephalopods, octopus in particular, but not in nautilus. And that, by the way, is their italicis. Um, adenosine to inosine mRNA editing. What it does is it converts adenine to inosine, which is very similar to guanine. Guanine has an extra oxygen at one end, but inosine will, for example, bind with cyto uh, match with cytosine if necessary. So what's happening here is you're having the DNA code changed after it's been transcribed, which is pretty impressive if you think about it. Unless all the new genes expressed in the squid octopus lineages arose from simple mutations of existing genes in either the squid or in other organisms sharing the same habitat, there's surely no way by which this large qualitative transition in A to I mRNA editing can be explained by conventional neo-Darwinian processes, even if horizontal gene transfer is allowed. One plausible explanation in our view is that newly gene, new genes are likely new extraterrestrial imports to Earth, most plausibly as an already coherent group of functioning genes within, say, cryopreserved and matrix-protected fertilized octopus eggs. Almost as if somebody planned it that way. Thus, the possibility that cryopreserved squid and or octopus eggs arrived in icy bolide several hundred million years ago should not be discounted below, as that would be a parsimonious cosmic explanation for the octopus's sudden emergence on Earth about 270 million years ago. Indeed, this principle applies to the sudden appearance in the fossil record of pretty well all major life forms covered in the prescient concept of punctuated equilibrium by Eldridge and Gould, advanced in the early 1970s, and see the conceptual cartoon of figure six, which we will see next. Um, we're gonna skip on after that, but uh, does any of this look vaguely familiar to you? This, of course, is an evolutionary tree. Everything's connected to the central branch, uh, central trunk. This is a forest of various trees. They're advocating for the forest. I actually like that. The only thing left is time, but we'll come to that later. 15, moving on, the Cambrian explosion. It is well known that a mass extinction event or events occurred at the end of the Ediacaran uh, period about 542 million years ago. This was the immediate forerunner of the Cambrian explosion and the mass extinction scale suggests the passage of our solar system through a giant molecular cloud, dislodging multiple long period Earth com cloud comets into the inner solar system, setting up impacts with the Earth. It takes little imagination to consider that the Precambrian mass extinction event was correlated with the impact of a li giant life-bearing comet or comets and the subsequent seeding of Earth with new cosmic-derived cellular organisms and viral genes. There may indeed have been a complex comet debris stream implying multiple impacts over the estimated 25 million years at the start of the Cambrian explosion. So maybe Maybe there's more than one, but in somewhere, in addition to destroying the life before, they brought new life. So the Cambrian organisms are not necessarily descended uh, directly, certainly not in a Darwinian way, from previous organisms. Basically, um, their proposal is almost that of an intelligent design. Um, the only difference is that they would not say necessarily that somebody planned that to happen, um, only that there was stuff out there 
that could get to Earth and start growing. Skipping on, it should also be stressed in this context that Eldridge Gould punctuated equilibrium, figure six, is often presented as an explanation of the observed facts of evolution, but it is not. It is the use of words to describe a striking phenomenon which itself lacks a plausible explanation within the framework of Earth-centered biology. Ouch. It goes without saying that tardigrades, micro-segmented tiny eukaryotic animals which emerged in the Cambrian period, posed a serious challenge to traditional neo-Darwinian thinking. Interesting, Wikipedia is apparently a, an adequate uh, reference. Um, <clears throat> the catalog of living space, har uh, pardon me, living space hardy properties is entirely consistent with evolutionary natural selective events acting on tardigrades evolving in extraterrestrial space environments these properties are incompatible with known purely terrestrial natural selection conditions either now or 500 million years from now. Why do you need an organism that can survive to almost zero degrees uh, Kelvin? In space you do, on Earth you really don't. Implications of Cam the Cambrian explosion and retroviral viral data. Before the extensive sequencing of DNA became available, it would have been reasonable to speculate that random copying errors in a gene sequence could, over time, lead to the emergence of new traits, body plans, and new physiologies that could explain the whole of evolution. However, the data we have reviewed here challenged this point of view. It suggests that the Cambrian explosion of multicellular life that occurred 0.54 billion years ago led to a sudden emergence of essentially all the genes that subsequently came to be rearranged into an exceedingly wide range of multicellular life forms. Tardigrades, the squid, octopus, fruit flies, humans, to name but a few. The expression of an entire new suite of retroviral genes of presumed external origin appears to have taken place mainly by via genomic rearrangements that followed ERV integrations. This is precisely the logic of evolution proposed by the late Sir Fred Hoyle and one of us, uh, Vikrama Singh, as far back as 1981. It was argued that copying errors of existing genes could not, on the average, produce new genes with functional utility. Where have we heard that argument before? By analogy with computer programming, it was pointed out that errors generated in copying a computer code would not lead to enhanced or new capabilities, but overwhelmingly to degradation of the original program. Sounds kind of like Sanford, doesn't it? Um, it was argued, therefore, that new genes for evolution must logically be supplied by the ingress of extraterrestrial virions and other microorganisms. You've got to get it from somewhere it's not going to happen here on Earth. Of course, it raises the question of how it arose elsewhere, too. Um, cosmic biology and the rise of mankind, and I'm just going to read one little piece of it. Indeed, a strong case can be made for hominid evolution involving a long sequence of viral pandemics, each one of which was a close call to total extinction of an evolving line. The most crucial genes relevant to evolution of hominids as indeed all species of plants and animals seems likely in many instances to be of external origin. I could agree with that. Um, being transferred across the galaxy largely as information rich variants. Well, maybe not quite that uh, way of doing it. Um, the cause of new e of epidemics and pandemics and new viro virology principles. So there they talk about flu virus, HIV, coming from space. It's an interesting point of view. And then they talk about paradigm shift. We believe the signs of this change, the paradigm shift that they're expecting, are now so apparent that one of the biggest backflips in the history of science is now on our doorstep. If you think that our position here is far-fetched or even alarmist, we quote the late, great Cornell professor Thomas Gold a far-sighted and creative astronomer and geophysicist who observed closely many scientific backflips back in his long career, the most notable being 
in the geosciences in the mid to late 1960s with the gigantic about face over Alfred Wegener's 1912 theory of continental drift. In 1989, Tom Gold wrote, what does the refereeing procedure really look like? How does it really go on? He's taking on uh, peer-reviewed literature too. If, for example, an application was made in the early 60s or late 50s suggesting that the person wanted to investigate the possibility that continents are moving around a little, it would have been ruled out absolutely instantly without questions. That was crackpot stuff, and had long been thought dead. Wegener, of course, was an absolute crackpot, and everyone knew that, and you wouldn't have any chance. Six years later, you could not get a paper published that doubted continental drift. The herd had swung around, but it was still a firm and arrogant herd. Check it out. He's got the reference. They've got the website there. A related example was the wide-eyed sp widespread institutional denial of the reality of meteorites during Lavoisier's time, who rejected eyewitness accounts of the fall of meteorites for the sound common sense reason that stones cannot fall from the sky as there are no stones in the sky. So we've seen this uh, before, Appendix A. This is, um, this is um, interesting, this is a philosophy thing. This gets particularly fascinating as you see the positions that they allow in the paper. The current situation is strikingly reminiscent of the Middle Ages in Europe. Ptolemaic epicycles that delayed the acceptance of a sun-centered planetary system for over a century, Appendix C. The current Evidence suggests we came from space. We are made of viral genes and eventually our evolutionary legacy would in full measure return to space. That will then complete the second and final phase of the Copernican revolution that was started over half a millennium ago. One of us, watch this, BK thinks that the complexity and sophistication of life cannot originate from non-biological matter under any scenario over any expanse of space and time, however vast. If this were to be so, then supernatural intervention or intelligence would be required following the standard Big Bang. Wow. How'd they get that through? A strictly scientific way around this dilemma would be to amend or tweak the Big Bang theory to allow for life from the eternal past. After all, the Big Bang theory is relatively new and is still occasionally amended. Therefore, it seems unready to forever overrule the unviolated principle and consistent evidence that life comes from life. So maybe there wasn't any Big Bang because if there was, then you can't explain life without a supernatural and of course we're not going there. Well maybe one of us is going there. Another of us, E.J. Steele, I assume that's the uh, first author, might state this same scenario a a little differently based on the positions published in Hoyle and Wickramasinghe. Is the universe an infinite steady state, a rolling series of big bangs and contractions as advanced in 1948 by Fred Hoyle, Tom Gold, and Herman Bondi, or just a conventional big bang? The latter is what most mathematical physicists, astronomers adhere to at the present time, but it cannot by any means be regarded as set in stone. Thus, Hoyle and Wick Ramasinghe, 1981, concluded that the improbabilities for the non-random assemblage of living proteins and nucleic acid are so huge, one part in 40, uh, 10 to the 40,000, that maybe an infinite universe, our super-intelligent God, <clears throat> ooh, ooh, hush their mouths, would be required to produce a living miracle, which then spread and evolved on a cosmic scale. It is the conf confrontation with these profound empirical-based issues that may well explain the honest and very public backflip of the late noted humanist philosopher Antony Flew. They, they are taking no prisoners. <laughs> <laughs> About 1960, Tom Gold, when asked in public and then, after surveying the evidence before him, apparently said it, stated in half jest, a spaceship landed on the Earth in the early days, scattering living cells, which have evolved and persisted ever since. Hoyle and Rick Ramasinghe, 
Uh, that's the, the reference there. Um, and it looks like they need a, a close, an open bracket somewhere. And this was given some considerable gravitas in 1973 by Francis Crick and Les Leslie Orgel. I'm going to stop right there. You know who those people are. Francis Crick was a co-discoverer of DNA. Nobel Prize. One of the more honorable Nobel Prizes. Leslie Orgel was at the time the most prominent researcher on the origin of life. And he got to the place where he was ready to throw up his hands and say, you can't do it. So they published their own theory of directed panspermia. That is not only panspermia, there's critters out there, but somebody wants them to be on Earth. A super intelligent civilization seeded life by sending spaceships three to four billion years ago. You see, when you look at the problems, you can't help but say, there's no way it can happen the standard way. Now, I'm going to stop there and give you my take on this. There's so much interesting to discuss about this article. One can, of course, make fun of the octopus theory. And my background in the slides is a gentle ribbing. But it is an attempt to solve a serious problem with evolutionary theory. Some of the authors appear to veer close to or into intelligent design territory. On this point, frankly, I agree with them. I think that it does take intelligent design. We can debate exactly what kind of intelligence, what their design was, but um, you try to account for this without design, it just won't work. And the whole article points that out. The octopus problem is just a special case of the general problem of evolution. How do you get sudden, um, all kinds of uh, carefully put together things without, uh, without a mind to make it work? The Cambrian explosion, as they pointed out, is another. But there's the mammal bird, angiosperm explosions that would also fit. In fact, probably if you go back, you'll find that there are explosions of everything. Just the Cambrian explosion had multiple explosions all at once. If new genes count as a problem for the octopus, what should we say about the orphan genes that crop up in, let's say, humans? You see, once you start going there, once you let go of unguided evolution as a mandatory explanatory principle, as the mandatory explanatory principle, where are you going to wind up? You could wind up anywhere. You would lose control. This fact is likely to create resistance to any loosening of the requirements that all processes must be unguided. Because they know if they let any, if they let the divine foot in the door, if they let the intelligent foot in the door, the rest will follow. Add to this the pressure from genetic entropy and, in my opinion, the attempt to explain all of life on the basis of unguided processes becomes fruitless. Now, this does not make us all creationists. There's still a matter of time. I hope to address a small part of that next week. Um, but it still leaves us more room to maneuver. And I think creationists can take comfort in the fact that this paper was published. Even though I would disagree on, on some of the things that they have to say. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes. Uh, th this is really... Uh Interesting. It's, it's, uh, I am encouraged by this paper. I, uh, I sit and wonder how long is the naturalistic scenario going to be able to hang on. It, uh, 
There's so much, so many problems that run into lately. Uh, I mean, of course, genetic entropy being uh, one we've discussed here quite a bit. Uh, I uh, I suspect that uh, we may see some breakthroughs here in uh, at least part of the scientific community. I expect there will be a solid naturalistic contingent uh, till the end of time. Uh, might be wrong, but uh, there's certainly so much room for breed down here. Uh, I mean, evolution is not working. They, they re many recognize this, you know. There's no, no way you have so many negative uh, uh, mutations compared to good ones, and you know, how, how do you select the good one? It's, it's really impossible. Uh, the, uh, it reminds me of a, uh, a lecture that was given here on this campus uh, somewhere in the 1970s. Uh, by a guest speaker at a uh, banquet. And he talked about the origin of life and he talked about some of the problems of the origin of life. Uh, and he uh, referred to the garbage theory of the origin of life. And we, uh, of course, smiled a little bit at that term. And uh, the theory is that uh, some extraterrestrial beings who were traveling and they came down here on Earth and uh, had a picnic on Earth and they left some germs here and in the form of the garbage they didn't clean up their garbage and this is the way life arose well this was so uh, <laughs> striking to me I thought uh, is this in the scientific literature? I found it uh, several years ago. I can't tell you right now where it is, but I, I found it in the scientific literature. Yes, the garbage theory, except that it's one of the theories for the original life. Of course, when they talk about uh, <laughs> the octopus from extraterrestrial that has some of the same problems, uh, is that, but, uh, uh, we're, we're advancing a different milieu here. I think that uh, at least the hope is that uh, there are a sufficient number of uh, objective scientists that uh, the tone may, may, may be tilting. And of course, uh, uh, from a uh, uh, perspective of future events in our Adventist uh, milieu, we do think that uh, the world will largely believe in, in, in God and so on, and but uh, uh, not in atheism. At least uh, seems to be a dominance of, of the God concept in the last uh, day events, mm -hmm. uh, and so. Uh, as uh, you mentioned, the issue may turn to time. Well, the thing I find fascinating is that this paper made it, whereas the paper that was detailing the movements of the hand had to be retracted because of mentioning a creator, which they could have easily uh, just taken out those two references, uh, three references in the paper. How long has this been out? I didn't get to uh, I think May. May. Mm -hmm. So it's they've had it. They've had a month or two to, to mm -hmm. try to squash it. Uh, Haven't done so. It just depends on who the editor is. I I like the uh, concept of garbage theory, but even better is spaceship theory, that the spaceship docked here on Earth and had intelligent beings and seeded life on Earth. 
Mm -hmm. um, the direction things are moving now from garbage to spaceship means that you have to create a whole new world of aliens. <coughs> now, the aliens could be non-materialistic thinking beings. You know, you can't close the door to that. And once you open that door, you can move in the direction of spiritualism. Yes. And Adventist eschatology definitely allows for spiritualism to be one of the major last day issues. Mm -hmm. So it may be a way of merging modern science and secular thinking with a new view of a spirit world that leaves God out of the picture. Because these spirit beings can be much more intelligent than human beings, but they're certainly not God. They don't have the power to create universe. Bec otherwise, we would have a whole bunch of universes all, all, all over the place. So there's a whole realm between if you have God as the superior being and you have mankind as being very inferior, you could put a, insert a whole realm of creatures there. So I'll be interested to see where this goes. So many of their cliches uh, have been repeated on this campus in years past by many of us. Uh, it's, uh, it's really, uh, the thinking is, you've got to go down that direction, you're thinking. There's just too many facts out there that just don't absolutely ruin yeah. the, the materialistic interpretation. What I, what I think we're seeing is an unstable situation, something like the uh, unstable situation we saw in Eastern Europe in the 1980s. There were a lot of people who thought that communism would last forever, and it lasted and it lasted and it lasted, and then all of a sudden a crack uh, showed up in the facade, and eight weeks later it was gone. Um, and I guess something like that happened, only it was a little slower um, to happen in uh, the theory of continental drift, where, uh, you know, the, the, the quote that's given is accurate, I think. Uh, you lived through that period. Oh, yes, and I've written about this in several articles. Uh, it, it was a dramatic, I lived right through it, folks. I was taking courses at UCR, and my professor, Schlanger, teaching uh, physical geology, <clears throat> he says, well, there was a name by a guy by the name of Wagner who <clears throat> got up and uh, suggested the continents, he says, but nobody pays any attention to him anymore. Five years later, these folks said six years. Five years later, um, I was in Atlantic City listening to a GSA report, a GSA meeting, uh, and that was the final lock on, hey, continental drift is it. There's no question about it. All the textbooks have to be changed. And it worked. I mean, it was five years later. I'm end up here. Let me pass the mic up. I think the kids who have seen uh, what's that pirate movie? Uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. Right. You know, one of the guys had a head like that, <laughs> but he 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 came back to human when he kissed a princess or something. I don't know. At <laughs> any rate, he was hidden in there. But it almost sounds like everything I learned about life, I learned in Star Trek. <laughs> or when I was a pastor years ago, down San Diego way, an Adventist girl wanted to marry a non-Adventist man. And she wanted me to talk to him about his belief system. And he uh, said, to make a long story shorter, he said, well, you're going to think this is funny. He said, but, but my whole spiritual bent 
is based on the Star Trek model. And uh, it went downhill from there. So, well, you know, all this is connected. You know, there are people out there who believe uh -huh. what you're saying, uh -huh. and it shows up in movies, and our kids see it. And hopefully, they have parents who are smart enough to uh, kind of guide them back a little bit. If, if you have the chance sometime, look at the movie Galaxy Quest. If you know the Star Trek stories, you'll, it will bust your gut. It really will. Because they, <laughs> they do a good job of <laughs> lampooning it. Yes. This and then we have one back here. It just illustrates what I was saying a minute ago, that we have all of these uh, scenarios that are merging and so we have science fiction, science fiction emerging with science, and now spiritualism and all kinds of isms. Be interesting to see where it goes. Now I wanted to add something about my early training. It was sparked by Dr. Roth here. Um, in the 1970s, I started studying geology seriously in a formal way. And so we're talking about 40 years ago and, and more. All of this is, um, resurrects two of, two of the uh, scenarios that I face, two um, small episodes, but big episodes now. One, I was taking a class in invertebrate paleontology, Michigan State University, and you're dealing with how do you get invertebrates um, evolving so rapidly because all of a sudden life has hard parts and external skeletons and it's all within a, you know even a million or 200 two million years in the bottom of the Cambrian so our professor who was an evolutionist uh, charted the origin of life and he was able to draw diagrams on the board he had the whole geological column he could barely fit it in the backboard you know and then he would draw lines and most of the major phyla even back then go all the way back to Cambrian. Today, I think they, all the phyla that I know of go back to Cambrian now. Yeah. So he got it all diagrammed. He stepped back, I can still picture him standing on this side of the room. He said, well, this looks like special creation, doesn't it? <laughs> 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 then he, he always um, concluded, but, with the word but, but we know special creation doesn't work. Isn't that something? Another episode happened just three or four years after that. I was trying to get all the requirements in for my geology degree. By then I was teaching at Columbia Union College, so I had a couple classes left and I took a class again in invertebrate paleontology, George Washington University, and I had the privilege of uh, studying under a Smithsonian research scientist, I.G. Sohn, and we were looking at um, ostracods and some of these other uh, uh, marine organisms, um, you know, forams and, and coccoliths and some of these uh, multi-celled organisms in the ocean. And for some reason, I was his only student. <laughs> no one had signed up for that class. So he said, Warren, let's go over to the Smithsonian from now on. I'll take you into my laboratory and we'll do the class there with hands-on experience. That was a chance of a lifetime. And little by little, as we talked one-on-one -on -one with no one else listening, he was able to confide in me. And he said, you know, I'm a polyphyleticist, which is a fancy way of saying that life did not have an origin with one line of organisms. Life originated uh, independently with multiple lines of origin, polyphyleticism. And right away I picked up on that. I knew that. I said, that's interesting. I am too. Polyphyleticism. It's uh, from the word phyla or phylum. So you have many phyla you know, the diagram that I talked about on the board of all these phyla going back, but you can't draw dotted lines uh, between the major phyla, or phylum is singular. So anyway, I.G. Sohn 
then confided in me, and I always appreciate this. He said, you know, I believe in the geological time and the long ages and all. He said, but my colleagues accuse me of being a creationist. That's about the time of the trial at Arkansas, almost within a year or two. And he was accused of being a creationist. He says, I'm not a creationist. That is a young earth creationist. So two episodes in my life, and now we see the picture hasn't changed significantly. No. In and and here, years. here again, this yeah, is monophyletic, good. and this is polyphyletic. Yes, on the left. That's right. Very good. Thank you. Go ahead. The year I spent at Newbold College, here, here, send it over I here. did a research oh. project on Mother Anne, who is a, a um, what's the term I'm looking for? No, I'm looking for a celibate. Mother Anne was a celibate society that was kicked out of various European countries and ended up in the United States. She had a city or small area around her that she developed. And the children in that group were visited by famous personages, spiritists. And they had a nice time with the children, and that attracted the adults. And that went on until one day, one of the spiritualists said that they would not be coming anymore, that they were going out into every city and hamlet in America. Immediately thereafter, we had the wrapping of the Fox sisters and the birth of spiritualism. So an entire, now in my mind, and you correct me on this, I have a memory of a scene in which Satan and evil angels had a council on how to work amongst humans. Is that a... <clears throat> but in any case, spiritualism as a method of attacking religion was born at that point. Uh, just a, a small point. I mean, I, I really like this paper. Uh, I'm a little uncomfortable with his repeated and heavy reliance on punctuated equilibrium. I don't think it applies to the question he's asking. Punctuated equilibrium, as you know, is at the generic uh, family level at best. And uh, where Eldridge and Gould applied it and so on, and that's uh, while he's asking a question at <clears throat> the cephalopod level, which is a class of the uh, mollusks. And uh, so, uh, but, uh, but uh, some of the other ideas he proposed there towards the end of that paper, uh, this is classical creationism. Well, yeah, in, in some ways. The time, the time scale is off. Sure. Um, that's, that's going to be the big issue, I think. But, yeah, I've, the arguments are very tightly constructed to, to say, look, evolution without some kind of help is not able to explain the fossil record on Earth. And they say, you know, you can have supernatural help. You can have help from outer space. And it almost sounds like some of them are kind of leaning towards the quasi-deliberate help. At least I have a hard time imagining cryopreserved octopus eggs landing here without some people or octopi or something deciding that they want that to happen. I, I think that what we're looking at is the, the attempt to say that these things didn't arrive here simply by accident. That there was some kind of design involved. And it looks like if you approach it in the right way, in the right journal, you can actually get that stuff published. <clears throat> so 
I think mm -hmm. that should give some of us encouragement to try doing things. I think we need to keep in mind that uh, a lot of scientists believe in God. And I'll refer back to that Pew research that I uh -huh. dig up every once in a while around here, uh, where uh, they analyzed the members of AAAS Association, asked them the question, and was it 34% of them said they believed in a God, and 17% said uh, they believed in some kind of deity, meaning that 51% of scientists believe in something out there. They're not pure naturalists. And uh, you get too many of these guys as editors, you may get more and more articles like this out there. Well, the other thing is that you get too many of those people, period. And when it becomes obvious that, and it becomes obvious to them, that life cannot arise from non-life for both experimental reasons and for theoretical ones, that at some point some of them are going to say, you know what, there was a God. And maybe he created life too. And maybe we should just stop all this Falderall trying to hypothesize warm little ponds or hot little uh, 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 underwater springs or stuff like that. That it, if it doesn't make sense, why are we fighting this? Let's let it go and let let, let God be the person. And of course, that's a God of the gaps. Well, but God does not have to destroy science. God can be the originator of science as. The pioneers of modern science believed. They thought those laws they were discovering were the laws of God. He put them there and uh, this is an imaginary, imaginary conflict between God and science. And I have to bring out that Hoyle himself, who figures pretty prominently in this paper, uh, mentions that there is a resonance structure that allows carbon to form in the middle of stars. There is another resonance structure that destroys much of the forming of oxygen from carbon. Without that, we would not have any carbon. Mm -hmm. Without either one of those. And as he puts it, the universe at that point looks like a put-up job. And this is a put-up job not only from the point of view of uh, the, uh, the actual universe itself, but the fundamental laws that make up the universe, that's not something that you can explain by some kind of evolved uh, intelligence that takes control of the universe and starts manipulating it, that is something that has to be there before the universe gets started. Mm -hmm. The laws of the universe were designed, it screams designer, um, that designer is so brilliant that he can figure out uh, nuclear chemistry and he is so powerful that he can make it happen all over the universe. Uh, it's really hard to withhold the name God from that intelligence. Why is matter organized at all instead of just being incoherent goo? Uh, it's very complex and the precisions of the forces of physics are so precise there's just no way this could happen uh, without some very intelligent design. And so you can have your intelligent designer being partly organisms out there that periodically see the earth with comets and whatnot, or you can have your intelligent designer being a god who is created and it stood fast, who spoke and it was done, who said let there be light and there was light, 
let there be a firmament or an expanse mm -hmm. is probably a better translation and there was an expanse and so forth and um, you know, I, drawing on our last week's thing, all these, all these species, including humans, go back 100 to 200,000 years ago. And if you correct that for actual physical <laughs> measurements of how fast mitochondria mutate, you get about 6,000 years ago, maybe four, maybe eight, mm -hmm. somewhere in that range. <laughs> um, you know, it starts to sound like Maybe we should be paying more attention to that old book. Um, the, the case is closed. Uh, we have a comment here, and I think we'll let that go unless somebody really needs to. Oh, you're going to get two mics here. <laughs> Anybody else? I'm going to have one mouth. I'm going to read Oh, okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Uh, it appears society and the world continue to lean more and more to not responding to authority. So maybe a bottom line is we don't want to go to a biblical place because then, then that calls me to responsibility and yeah. accountability. Yeah. Um, it, it seems just in recent times that uh, authority of, of any level, at any level, not just biblical authority, but um, the whole fabric of people wanting to do their own thing does not lean. I mean, as soon as you as soon as you accept God as Creator, you put different glasses on. Yeah. No rebuttal needed. Amen. Okay. <laughs> Well, with that, I'm going to encourage you to come back next week as we talk about humans in, the, in North America, actually in Southern California, no less, uh, 130,000 years ago, and the implications it has for uh, the time question.